Good afternoon. I am um, going to talk today about extending OpenStack Ansible with automated operational management. I am William Irons, an advisory software engineer at IBM. Been working in cloud for the past about eight and a half years, but I've been working with OpenStack for only a year, probably less than that. And this is actually my first conference. So today we're going to talk a little about about you know what we're the background, what we're doing, um, why we need operational management. We're going to talk about OpenStack Ansible, how it can be extended. It's a if you haven't used OpenStack, it's a great tool. OpenStack Ansible, it's a great tool for deploying your cloud. I like to think of it as the Rocket Mortgage commercial push button get cloud. It's you know, it's really easy for us to um, to create a cloud instance. We're going to show the operational management solution we created using Nagios for um, monitoring your cluster and using Elk, the Elk Elastic Stack for for a log analysis and trends of your of your cluster. We're going to so we're going to show at the, at the end. We're going to show a, a little demo. So we can go into the um, background of what, of what we're doing. So if you haven't used um, OpenStack Ants before, you should really give it a try. It, it's a, um, the main goal of it is to provide a consistent install of OpenStack. I mean, there's multiple products out there. For, for me, OpenStack Ants was the easiest to, 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 um, to consume, I would say. If you haven't tried it before, you can actually um, create your own Ubuntu 1604 VM. You can go out to the Quick Start web page and run a few commands, and you'll have a cloud in your VM. So it's, it's, very, in, it's very easy to try. Within a few hours, you can have a cloud up and running and, and, and um, you know, get the experience of what it's like. If you haven't used Ants before, it's pretty easy. So what we liked about you know, OSA was that day one deployment. You know, you click off a thing and your day one deployment's done. But then after that, what, you know, what do you do day two forward? How do you monitor it to make sure it's up and running? How do you, how do you know the health is staying consistent? When are you going to run out of resources? And that's what we looked at. You know, we looked at well, how can we monitor it? What, can we, what, can we add, what value can we add to it for our customers so that they can you know, monitor the solution after it's been deployed? Um, a lot of our solution was borrowed from Rackspace. They gave us a head start. They had already extended OpenStack Ansible to install Elasticstack on an OpenStack cluster. So we took that solution and, and kind of um, expanded on it. Just some um, background to what, we, what, what we're doing. So I'm part of a um, larger team that's focused on getting the OpenStack um, Cloud Toolkit for OpenPower. So we have a bunch of components of that team. Um, I'm on the operations manager team, but we have a team that does hardware setup, so um, bare metal provisioning of the hardware. We use Ceph for block storage, Swift for object storage, um, of course, Nova and, and Neutron for private cloud, Troll for database as a service. And you know, while, we're, while I'm focused on making sure the OpenStack runs on power, while the demo today works on x86 and Power Little Indian, and it's Ubuntu 1604. It's using the Newton branch of OSA. Everything I demoed today, I verified that it works with Okada, although it's not officially in our toolkit yet. There's a few bugs with the new version of Ansible for Okada. But the concepts for how you extend, extend OpenStack Ansible apply. And uh, it's all, you know, right now, but right now, Newton only, for OpenStack Ansible, Newton only supported Ubuntu 16, 1604, so that's what we are supporting too. So, what is OpenStack Ansible and how can it be extended? So, Ansible, have you, has anybody not used Ansible or not heard of Ansible? Ansible is, you know, it's like Chef or Puppet, it's another open source automation platform. You know, the big difference between Ansible and, and the other ones is it's agentless. It doesn't require anything to be installed on the um, endpoints. It uses SSH to configure everything. And OpenStack Ansible is the um, provides Ansible playbooks for the deployment and configuration of OpenStack. The big thing that OpenStack Ansible does is you don't have to do it this way, but the default settings I think with OpenStack Ansible are it creates LXC containers for every service. So so um, on your Troll node, you have a container for Glance and for Cinder 
and it, for Horizon. On the compute nodes, I'm not sure if you have, you have the Nova services running on bare metal. I think you have Neutron running in a, in a container, but it makes it, it makes it easier when you have container, containers to separate your logic. And the other main thing it does is it has HA proxy, which forwards the quest from the front end and from the floating IP, so it acts as a load balancer between multiple controllers to the back end, the back end being the LXC containers that are on a private network. So HA proxy has a you know, dual purpose. It does the HA, the, um, HA high available load balancing, and it also has the stuff that takes the request from the front end to the back end LXC container. So why would you extend OpenStack Ansible? Um, the reason we, you know, we're at code, we want to automate something that you know, there's manual, manual today. We want to do it in a consistent manner so there's um, less user intervention, less, less chance of failure. Um, it's just, you know, OpenStack Ansible is really easy to install. You want your stuff to be installed with it. Anything, anything you're adding, any value you're adding to, you know, to your cloud, you, you want to be doing the same thing. So you can, you want to install in the same manner. So if you install 10 clouds, they're all installed and configured the same way. So to extend OpenStack Ansible, there's four main things you need to do, and these are actually really simple, as we'll sh I'll show you in, in a minute. We need to create LXC containers for additional services. So in our example, we're, we're installing the Elasticsearch, which we're installing El Elastic, Kibana, and Logstash all in, all in three separate containers, and we're installing Nagios in a fourth container. You want to write Ansible playbooks for installing customer, custom services and configurations. So these are playbooks to install Logstash or Nagios or whatever you guys want to install for, for your customers. You need variable files for user-defined variables, so things like the, the passwords to the systems you want to use or configuration settings, wherever you want to, whatever, whatever you want the user to configure with your things, you just need to create variable fi files. And, um, HA proxy configuration for accessing the service. So you need to tell the front end, you know, how to access your back end. And actually, all, most of this is just a few lines of code. So if you want to create LXC containers for additional services, all you need is the file I sh um, show here. So under Etsy OpenStack Deploy env.d, you have to create a, a um, YAML file that talks about the, creator, the container you want to create. And it looks kind of confusing. It took me a long time to get my head around exactly what it's doing in this small little file. But um, it's in the first section, component skeleton, it's saying you have a component. This is, elastic, this is um, the elastic search, um, single elastic search container. Um, you have a component elastic search that belongs to elastic search all. It belongs to is mainly for Ansible dynamic inventory so that when you create a role in the next step, you want to install, um, when, you, when I say I want to install this, that I want to install the, the code, I want to install it, Elasticsearch and all the hosts that have the Elasticsearch all tag. The container skeleton says that um, I have Elasticsearch container that belongs to log containers, and log it, and um, I'll skip that for a second, and contains Elasticsearch. When it contains Elasticsearch, it goes back up to the component skeleton and and that's the kind of association between the container skeleton and the component skeleton. The belongs to log containers tells, tells um, OpenStack Ansible to install this on any host that is identified as a log container. So in, this, in the default OpenStack Ansible setup, log containers are associated with the controller nodes, and, and log containers was originally defined by um, RSS log. So wherever the RSS log container is installed, the Elasticsearch will, will container will be installed also. The properties are an arbitrary name value pair. I'm not really sure what they're used for, but um, I've just been copying the other templates and just saying the name of my um, service that's running inside the, the, um, inside the container. So I didn't put in here the physical skeleton. You could, if you do a physical skeleton, if you wanted to install these on a completely different box from everything else, you could say um, belongs to 
um, elk, stack elk stack containers and then have a physical skeleton that says my elk stack containers will be on the elk stack host and then and in an additional YAML file, you need to say which host actually is going to is going to host those. But once you create a file, you know that size. When you run the setup host YAML playbook, so either from the start where you have an OSA hasn't even run yet, or if you run it again, OSA will go out there and it'll look at the directory. It will see that file. It will say, "Oh, I need to create you know a container called Elasticsearch on all my controllers." So you don't need to write your own code to do it. You have, obviously you have your own option to write your own code. If you want, you know, we actually done that because we didn't want to. We wanted our playbooks to run without, be able to run without OpenStack. And if you do that, you end up with a lot of hassles, like having to ensure you don't conflict with the IP addresses that OSA uses. So I would say it's much easier to just create a properties file and have OpenStack Ansible create your containers versus doing it yourself. The Ansible playbooks themselves are pretty easy if you know how to automate what you what you want to install. The um, so Ansible playbooks are necessary for installing any customer any service you want to install. So you created a container, now you have to install the, the things on it. It could be as simple as doing an app get install and writing out a configuration file, restarting the service. It could be complicated as if you have a program, um, downloading the program, downloading, you know, if it's a Go program, downloading Go, Go um, compiling it and creating, you know, the service. It can be, you know, as simple or as, um, simple or as complex as you want to. Any, um, you know, anything you can automate with the command line, you can automate with Ansible. But when, once you learn Ansible, it's pretty easy. It's just a YAML file and it's, it's a really descriptive language. Where you place them doesn't really matter, because um, you're going to be, you know, you're going to you're going to be calling the playbooks from whatever directory you're running them from. There are some stuff that comes with OpenStack Ansible that you can leverage, at, you know, as necessary. If you want to use an existing Ansible role, there, you know, the, op, the OpenStack Ansible roles are defined under op OpenStack Ansible playbooks roles or NC Ansible roles or the roles for installing Horizon Glance and all the component services. Um, the library uh, points to the different plugins that Ansible include, OpenStack Ansible includes, includes. I haven't really leveraged them. But the inventory file, inventory one is the important one. When you, um, run, when, you run, when you run Ansible without specifying inventory file, if you have the Ansible config file, it will automatically kick off that inventory, which is the OpenStack inventory, which will list all the containers, including the, like, the Elasticsearch container we created in the previous step. So if you have a playbook that says, I want to install this on all Elasticsearch host, it will see the, you know, it will, say, it will tell Ansible what, you know, what containers those are, and Ansible will, will go do that. When you create the playbook, you run the playbook easy, um, using either the OpenStack Ansible command or the Ansible playbook command. Now you may ask what's the difference of those two commands. It's the next page. So um, as I mentioned, you, you, know, you have these user-defined variables for whatever you want your user to customize with your playbook. Um, the difference between those two commands is if you use the OpenStack Ansible command, it will read in the variable files matched in the name format Etsy OpenStack um, user splat.yaml and call, can call Ansible Playbook. So it doesn't do anything really magic. It just reads in the variable files that you create and passes them to Ansible Playbook. Um, they, we don't, they don't, Ansible doesn't recommend overwriting the existing user variables and user secrets. You know, don't add things. You can change things because that's, you know, you can change the values. That's how you change the default install of OpenStack Ansible, but they don't recommend adding new things to those files because when they do an upgrade, they're going to wipe out the file and replace it or you know, make their own updates to it. So it's safe for just create your, creating brand new files. If you don't want those variables to include, be included, you, you can just call Ansible Playbook, pass the dash E option, include, include your own variable files. So with that, you know, once you, once you um, create your playbook and you in, in, and um, run it, then you have your service installed on, you know, you have your container, you have your service installed on the container. 
The last thing you need to do is um, define HA proxy for accessing the back end. So you, you have the front end here, you have the containers running on the private network on, on the host, you need to associate the two. And all you need to do in that case is create a variable that, that explains your um, additional services you're, at, you're adding to, to um, OpenStack Ansible. So OpenStack Ansible already has a variable HA proxy services that's internal that defines all the proxies that they want to configure. They added this additional variable HA proxy extra services so you can define additional proxies for them to create. And these are the minimal configura configurations, um, pretty simple. Um, what's the service name for your HA proxy? What's the um, backend nodes that, that um, it should map to? So that this is where we use that last extra all back, um, variable It's gonna replace that with all the, all the, all the containers, the container on each controller. Um, the port that you want to proxy, so here a port, or that or last search works on port 9200. We're proxying it from 9200 from the host, host to 9200 in the back end. You can, there is a back end port, if they're different, you can specify that as a, um, as a, as a variable. And then the balance type, or this is actually inside HA proxy, it's mode, it's, um, not the best name of it, but the variable, I think. But um, this is, are you, are you gonna go, is, it, is, is the port talking TCP, TCP, UDP, HTTP? This is where you specify that. So there's a lot of other variables available. You know, the best way to look at this is actually look at the OpenStack Ansible code and the template for configuring HA proxy. I don't think all the variables are documented at all. I took it as a to-do to try to document the variable. To, to, Talk, got to work with the team to get the variables documented. And then, you know, once you, once you create the variable file and you um, run the HA proxy install YAML playbook, HA proxy will configure, you know, it will automatically configure HA proxy, and then you'll, have your, then you'll have everything set up. You'll have your container, everything installed in your container, and HA proxy will be forwarding the quest to your backend container. So it's, it's pretty easy to extend OpenStack Ansible, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of configuration and, and not really much code. The, the code is just what code you want to add for, for installing your particular service. So what we did with Operational Manager, I'm gonna go in here, um, we did three main things of it. We added a Horizon user interface extension, kind of a dashboard. Um, actually, I'll go, in this to, go, go straight to that. Um, a dashboard to keep track of inventory. Um, the system admins have a need to know where the hardware is located, what rack, what machine type model, what, what firmware is running on it, what operating system is running on it. You know, they need to know how to find the rack if there's, if there's, um, if there's a problem. And not all that information is available, readily available in, open, in, open, in the OpenStack user interface. So we wanted to add a physical, um, a location for, to see the physical, um, the physical structure of your rack, and from this interface, we're actually, you know, this is a launching point for future enhancements. So, you know, we want to provide the ability for a user to add or remove nodes from a cluster, to um, perform firmware updates, you know, take the cluster down or take the not, not cluster down, take the, take a node of the cluster down, do updates, bring it back up. You know that, that um, those maintenance of the cluster over time. Um, we added Nagios to monitor the cluster, and there's a bunch of um, open source tools that um, you can pick. Nagios has you know been around forever. Zabbix is a popular one. Um, we chose Nagios because we had a lot of experience with it. It's been around for a long time. It's it's open source. You can do all the configuration via config files. So for if you want to answer playbooks and you want to write out what you want to monitor, it's very easy. You know, you don't need to go into you know a web UI. And our goal with this was to be able to monitor the OpenStack cluster of Nagios and not have the user not have the user have to do any configuration in Nagios. It would just autom it would everything is automatically set up so they can just 
it's you know they 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 run they run the scripts and that's Nagios is monitoring it. They don't need to go and muck with Nagios config files. Um, our solution is ostensible in that we are you know we can't allow other um, things to be dropped in. We I want to add Zabbix, so I'm not quite sure how to add Zabbix. It's something we need to research, but it's a it's a popular one that I would definitely like to add. This kind of, this chart kind of shows how how um, Nagios works. It's a polling mechanism where Nagios is running on the controllers. Um, it calls a command line checking RPE, which calls a agent running on all the endpoints. Um, the Nagios remote plugin execution a agent, and depending on what endpoint it is, it, it can check to see if a process is running, check the load on the server, check the Ceph. Um, monitors, you can write any, you know, if you can write a command line that returns zero for okay, one for warning, two for critical, then, then you can monitor it. So that's another thing we liked about Nagios was that, that um, it, you know, you can write any kind of plugin you want to, to, to extend it. For the log analysis, we, you know, as I mentioned before, Rackspace with their RPC OpenStack and GitHub had already extended um, OpenStack Ansible to install the Elastic Stack, Elastic Stack. So we kind of piggyback on them, but it is a very popular open source log analysis tool. Um, it has high availability and low balancing built into the design, which is important, of course. We have three controllers we want to, um, you know, keep, stay up if one controller goes down. Nagios doesn't have high availability built into it. It's not a reason I don't particularly happy with it, but we have done some hacks to try to get it to be high availability. Um, so the, 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 what what, um, what the Elk stack really helps us with the Elastic stack is you can visualize your data over time. You know, what, the log information, depending on what kind of log is you have, how, uh, um, glance and keys, Glance, Trove, a lot of the APIs have response times. You can see, you know, what's the response time to my APIs or trends. Whatever information in the log, Ceph has read, write, operations per second, how much space is used. Whatever information is in the logs, you can visualize, you know. The last bullet here kind of says, if it's, you know, we can't visualize anything if it's not in the logs. So I was kind of, it's hard for me, as I don't know every part of um, OpenStack, to say what's most important to monitor in the, in the logs. So we tried to pick and choose, but um, I think you know there is a discussion tomorrow about um, someone else's experience, a lightning talk about someone else's experience using Elasticsearch, and I'm curious what they found in the logs to monitor, because I'm always look, interested in improving what, what, what we monitor in the OpenStack logs. And obviously, the more stuff you log, the more you can visualize. So this graph kind of shows that while Nagios was a um, poll mechanism, checking for health every 10 minutes or so, um, log analysis, or ELK is a kind of a push mechanism. So we have metric beat and file beat installed in the endpoints. Metric beat does, um, gathers data, I thought I got chopped, I guess, no, never mind. Gathers just data from um, like commands like top system data, like CPU usage, memory usage, process uses, a ton of data, and it sends that to Elasticsearch. File beat takes the OpenStack logs line by line as they're into the logs, sends that to Logstash to be parsed and in the individual fields, and, Elastic, and then sends to Elasticsearch to store. Elasticsearch is the, is the um, main part of the Elastic stack in that it stores all the data and provides APIs for querying the data. Kibana is, is, is the front end that visualizes the data. So in this picture, Logstash and Kibana are stateless. Elasticsearch is the one that um, stores all the data. And with Elk 5.5x, five, um, five a lot of the Logstash function has moved into Elasticsearch, so we're actually looking at dropping Logstash in a future version if we can.
this is an example of what a log looks like and what you got to parse and how sometimes it's not um, completely easy to parse. But um, so here we have uh, so the top um, four lines are what we get from from FileBeat. So we got a, we got a line, a log line from FileBeat that's from host integration rack three controller one. They got the long message that came in the string. Um, we got the source, which is the name of the log file, and the tags. We, we can, with FileB, you can say, you know, this log file has these tags, so we can query on it. You know, give me the Ceph logs, give me the Ceph monitor logs. It helps with visualizations. And the, the part that's highlighting green, we broke down and we break down, you know, using regular expressions, Grok regular expressions, you break it down into individual fields. So we can say, you know, keyword available, a um, number, percent, that number is available percent. And then, you know, total number and space, words, com word, comma, that um, the number, that total is, the number is total space, the units is, the next thing is total units. And then one of the first things we ran into when we did Ceph was that Ceph will actually log different, different sizes. So if you start with a small cluster, the space used may be bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and then it can grow up to gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes. And if you just take those numbers and graph them without looking at the unit and the measure, your, your graphs are completely useless. So we have to do some conversion here that says, the unit of the measure is gigabytes translated to, to megabytes so that we can have a consistent graph. And Logstash gives us that ability to do that. If we capture the units that it was, then we can do that, do that conversion. So I'm actually gonna switch now and I wanna demo this, so maybe that, maybe that will, um, Maybe that will kind of help visualize everything. Unfortunately, I didn't plan on using the smaller resolution, so <laughs> I'm gonna have to make do here. So this is our, um, this is our Ryzen dashboard. I am um, VPN into IBM into the Austin, Austin lab where we have a um, test environment. So we added this um, inventory dashboard that kind of shows our rack. And we have three compute nodes. And I believe, let's see, I'm gonna see, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I dare shrink this. Or is that too small? I might, I might not make around with it. We have um, three compute nodes, three controller nodes, three storage nodes. They are running the Ubuntu, they're all um, power nodes. And from this, you know, I mentioned this is our launch and off point. The, you know, we don't have it functional yet, but if you wanted to add a new system, you could add it here. If you wanted to remove a system, you can, you can do it through here. Removing a system would involve, you know, getting the workloads off or at least preventing new workloads from going on, on it. And of course, it depends if you're removing a compute node or storage node, the different actions you gotta take. Add a system would be, provisioning the system to be included in, into the cluster. The field called EIA location, you can edit. You know, this is the, we don't know it by default when we install, but this is the location of the, of the um, machine in the rack. So for a system admin, it has to go replace a machine, do something on the machine, it's important they know where it is. We do have a rack de um, de detail section up here that they can edit, they can say what they wanna call the rack, what data center it's in, what room it's in, what row it's, what's, what, what, what row in the room it's in, and any notes about the rack, so that um, again you can the admin can find the rack, and we have plans to, to add additional racks. That's why it's kind of a tabbed interface, but we don't have a add rack button uh, here yet. And then for the launch to Nagios or Elk, you can go directly to the URL, but we also have the launch, launch point here. You can, you know, if we click on um, monitoring, 
we can we can march over to Nagios. And we were up today until until today, I guess. So this is just this is Nagios core out of the box, really unmodified, but you know it's all, it's already been configured for the user. So here's the host that we're we're modifying. We have three compute nodes, as I mentioned, two controller nodes, three services. We have local host. I'm actually going to get rid of. That's not Yoast monitoring itself in the container. It creates it by default. Um, not very useful. And then for services, the thing I wanted to show about services is you we monitor different things depending on on what object is. So we have a compute nodes, so we monitor the OpenSec compute nodes. And if we drill down in this, you can actually see we are monitoring three different things when we monitor, monitor OpenStack compute nodes. We're monitoring that we have Nova running, we have Liver D running, and we have um, Neutron running. On the controllers, we went. We we try to monitor each container separately. We don't monitor every single check in a controller as one check. We kind of lump them into, you know, for glance. What's all the things you can check with glance? We put them into one check so we don't overload the user with, with the hundreds of checks. But um, this kind of shows all the different things. You know, if there's a problem in Keystone, it would show up red here. Um, at the top, you can see there's all, um, they're all okay. If I had time, I would go kill Keystone, and we would show it turn red, so you can easily, at one, one quick glance, see, see what your problem is. It has all the, um, it has all the, all the features of, of Nagios. Because we're running out of time, I'll quickly switch to Elk. So from the same view, you can launch to Elk. This is our, our default dashboard for um, Elastic for 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 OpenStack, and it kind of shows. This is a um, integration test rack that has not ha seen a lot of usage, but it kind of shows the total number of requests, which is a lot of requests um, that come through. Just OpenStack talking to each each other um, does a lot. The, you know, OpenStack is constantly, constantly doing REST requests to each other. And I, I'm not sure exactly why. I don't know the details of OpenStack, but you can see. In the last 12 hours, it handled 4,000 requests. 2,000 were an error. All those errors are from Keystone, and I, I want to say that's just business as usual. That's how Keystone works. So that's something that if, probably Keystone shouldn't be flagging as an error, because it's not a really error. It just causes noise. One of the ones I like to show is the Ceph dashboard. And this is, um, by default, it's the last four hours. And you can see, um, the, you know, it shows you bytes written over time, operations, operations per second. So we're getting this from, from, from the logs. And with this, you know, with this, with Elk, you can easily go back and change the duration. You know, if I want to do the last 30 days, which was the cluster, this cluster wasn't created in 30 days ago. I can see, you know, from the log is the trend over time. So we created the cluster about 20, 20 days ago. We did we did a lot of testing with Ceph at that time, but we haven't really touched it since. So the usage, um, you can see the the bytes read, bytes written, operates per second has um, hasn't been hasn't been very much. You can see the available space has slowly going down. The use space is slowly going up. So you can see. We're not, you know, total space or available percent still way above 80. We're not worried about running out of space. But if, you know, if we, if you are, you would definitely see this, you know, the fact that you have all this data and you can look at, look at it, you know, at any time period you want is um, very useful. So if you want to draw down to a 15 minutes or a five minute period, you can do that. You know, we had a little spike here, although stuff is not really busy number of bytes written. 
it's it's you know it's really cool that you can just create a bunch of dashboards and then automatically change the time frame. I want to show you um, two other dashboards, or actually. So one of the things we like to do is monitor the request rate re re um, response time, and for the most part, the request rate's all low. So, but if there was a problem, you could you would see it here. The response, if you, if, you know, somebody complained about slow response, is it Nova? Is it Neutron? Is it Glance? You know, what's the problem? You know, you would see it here. You, you can look, go to this thing and say, oh, the response, the request response times from this component is much more than than normal. And again, you have that ability with the um, with the time thing that to go. You want to go 30 days or 15 minutes to drill down on your exact problem. And the last thing I'm going to show is Metric Beat. So Metric Beat gets us a bunch of pre-canned dashboards that we can um, that that come out of the box that, um, that show the data. So, you know, here's our, here's our nine systems, how much um, memory have they used. All oh, the controllers are using a bunch of memory, but the, the compute and storage is not doing really doing anything in this, has not heavily been used. We want to look at the processes that are taking the, much C, the most CPU. And um, if we hover over this, you know, we have a um, controller, one controller taking 33%, and basically the controller is taking much of the, pro much of the, um, much of the pro total product number of processes running. You can see the, um, this is for individual controller, so integration rack for controller number three, this is the CPU usage over the period of time and the memory usage, and this is, you know, by process. So Beam, which I think is, I think it's our log, but I can't remember. No, it's RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is our biggest CPU usage um, thing. I don't think it's configured correctly. Java is Elasticsearch. As you can kind of look at that, you can look at the, part, the memory usage. And, you know, you can click on any one, one thing and by clicking on the, that one controller, then, then, all, then my graph automatically changes to just logs from that controller. So um, all the processors from this controller, most of the processors are sleeping. There's a few running. There's 87 processes, and here's the CPU usage for that one controller, the memory usage for that one controller. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And I didn't leave much time for questions, so let me wrap this up um, quickly. So there's future work items that we're um, looking at. Um, going to Akata, of course, is something we're um, going to be doing very soon. Elasticsearch 5.3 is now in our master branch, so that's something I would like to demo, but I couldn't. Um, try, while I'm here, I'm trying to investigate Manasca and how we can leverage its monitoring. I really don't know much about it. O OpenStack Ansible himself is looking at a monitoring script framework for pipe, so I'm Pike, so I'm trying to um, learn more about that. And um, we want to support CentOS and Red Hat because we have customers, Red Hat cu customers from Red Hat, um, customers, Red Hat shop customers that want to use our, our tooling, but they want Red Hat and not um, Ubuntu. So there's some links to the code I demonstrated, the Ops Manager, and to our toolkit that I mentioned before in our um, reference designs. And questions. If you want to have a question, you know, please speak in the mic so we can be recorded. Uh, I wanted to ask you: uh, Have you tried to use OpenStack Ansible without uh, LXC containers? I have not, but um, it should there's, it should work fine. But I have not I have never no experience with that.
If you do have any more questions you want to follow up, my email is there at the bottom. That's the best way to contact me. I, you know, I am WD Irons and IRC, but I don't log in very often. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for your time.